uh, thank you, President. Uh, I, uh, today, probably, I will have to replace also my co-rapporteur, Madame Margarita Marx, uh, uh, because she is now, she is now uh, unfortunately absent, and she, uh, uh, she asked me to, to represent both of us. So we are the co-rapporteur for the MFF, I mean the spending part, and uh, uh, that's, that's why we, uh, we are now entering in the next step of the uh, negotiations. The next step of negotiation is quite, uh, quite complicated and very exceptional. Normally, we, um, it's, as, far, as far as concerns the MFF, uh, we are working on the, uh, on the consent from the Parliament to, to the Council after receiving the document from the Council. Of course, it's always, always um, uh, uh, prepared by the negotiation, but this time we have the uh, very specific situation because there is the package. The package coming from, uh, uh, from the Council, uh, first from the Commission and next from the Council, European Council through the uh, conclusions, the, the package uh, uh, consists of uh, first the, uh, the MFF, I mean the so-called multi-annual budget, which is based mainly on the national contribution, and, uh, and the, uh, the additional uh, uh, temporary uh, instrument, uh, which is the uh, uh, recovery fund, I mean next generation. In this package we have, I mean, first MFF, next the recovery fund, and thir uh, third element is the rule of law. So each of these elements is different and based on, on different procedures. Uh, uh, together with Madame Marques, uh, we are responsible for the, uh, for the first part, I mean the, the, uh, the MFF. Like the uh, uh, President just described, we, are, we have the mandate from the Parliament and the mandate from the Parliament is described in the resolution from 2018 and uh, uh, repeated or, or confirmed by the last resolution which has been made by the, by the Parliament. So we think that the reduction of the um, uh, main uh, spendings, meaning main policy spendings, what we uh, call the flagship programs, uh, the reduction of these programs in the MFF should have been uh, uh, compensated by the recovery fund, which after the conclusion of the European Council is not the case. So that's why in our Rust resolution we expressed, I mean we Parliament, we expressed our dissatisfaction uh, with the MFF. And we said that this version of the MFF is not acceptable. So that's why uh, uh, today we keep the man mandate from the Parliament concerning the 15 flagship programs. Uh, uh, for colleagues, I would just remind that um, uh, among the flagship programs, there is, uh, there are, um, they, they aren't the uh, cohesion policy in agriculture because this is something which is not, not in danger, in fact. This is defended by the, by the member states. Uh, so the flagship program is, is like the um, Horizon, like Erasmus, like the uh, border control, uh, defense fund, etc. So in the resolution of the Parliament, we have the list of these 15 flagship programs, and we will now start negotiate the, this, these programs, mainly the ceilings. Uh, in, in other words, we would uh, like to, to, to persuade the, uh, uh, the Council that this version cannot be accepted uh, by, by the Parliament because it will be in fact, reduction of policies. And just to summarize, President, I think this is, I, I, I couldn't be uh, yesterday, but it's like they do with the agencies. It's like if we don't have enough money for the policies, we will have to reduce the policies. It's clear. So I think that the, when we discuss the MFF, we are not discussing money. In fact, we are discussing the scope of the European policies. If there is a strong reduction of the policies, we, as Parliament, we should tell to the, not only to the Council, but to the, uh, uh, to the citizens of Europe, we will say, sorry, sorry, please do not expect from European Union that this policy will be made because there is no money for, for this policy. So that's why our role is 
to defend the, uh, what we call the ambitions or the policies of, of, of the European Union. So for this stage, we have the mandate. We will try to, um, uh, to discuss with the Council the possibilities and the methods to, to keep more money for concrete uh, flagship programs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, given the absence of Madame Marquez, as uh, Jan already indicated, uh, we now turn to Mr. Fernandez, uh, MFF co rapporteur Jose Manuel. The floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur. Uh... Thank you very much indeed, Chair. On own resources uh, in the MFF, the Parliament has been working flat out in a very ambitious and uh, responsible manner. Today in the Budget Committee we are voting on the, uh, the consultation on own resources. We worked throughout August to ensure this could be possible for the next plenary in September. We wanted to have the vote in plenary. Once that's done, we can start the ratification process uh, across the member states uh, according to the constitutional uh, laws in each member state. We hope that the Council will also uh, embark on this process as quickly as possible. Without the ratification by all member states, and as I said, this is in accordance with the uh, laws of each country, we will be unable to have a true recovery plan. And we can't envisage an MFF without a recovery plan. This is an historic moment. For the first time in 32 years, we'll have a new uh, source of uh, resources, own resources, and we'll also be granting the Commission the option to, look, to raise money on the markets, uh, uh, which could then be transformed into, uh, sub, uh, uh, into subsidies. But we cannot call up... We cannot... Uh, um, put a stop to this after 2021. We cannot just drop off a cliff edge, so we have to ensure that own resources are insured after 2021. They also have to be uh, in, uh, in line with the policies of the EU, and there has to be a, a full agreement across the board in terms of if you don't pay, you don't get anything back. We have to be in line with uh, the principles of competitiveness for the EU, uh, sustainable development, support for SMEs, For all these reasons, we have set out a very tight calendar to ensure that own resources are available throughout 2021, and they should be sufficient to, to pay the interest rates and, and the sums required under the recovery plan. One other thing I wish to add is that this recovery plan should represent the interests of the EU, the interests of the citizen. If they do not do this, no one will possibly understand how the, the recovery plan could form part of the budget without the budgetary authorities having their say. That's why we want the Parliament and the Council, because very often we uh, have to argue on behalf of the Council as well, we believe we need an annual procedure to ensure the recovery plan sums that are used in accordance with the guidelines we have all agreed upon. Now, it, this is a question of uh, democratic legitimacy, of uh, clarity, uh, transparency, uh, accountability. Citizens need to be able to see that their funds are dealt with and spent in a transparent manner. Now, in order to ensure this, we are amending the financial regulations, 
we are amending international agree institutional agreement, and that should give us the necessary democratic legitimacy. Let's not forget um, the other very important uh, point for the recovery plan. 750 billion euros, uh, 350 uh, billion in loans, uh, and nearly 400 in uh, subsidies. Now, we want for all these funds to be mobilized and uh, not a, a cent left over. If, for one reason or another, the funds are not used, we want to ensure they are fed back into the budget and they could be used for the, uh, the key programs of the EU, as my colleague said. And uh, I think that all member states should be able to agree with me on that point. Thank you. Merci, uh, José Manuel. Uh, next is uh, Valérie Ayer, Renew, uh, also uh, on resources co rapporteur Valérie. The floor is yours. Merci, merci, Monsieur le Président, cher collègue. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Colleagues, now, own resources, as you know, this has been something which the Parliament's been dealing with for uh, many, many years now. And this crisis and our response to the crisis, the recovery plan, which we table, uh, we suggested as uh, members of Parliament, has given an additional argument to the Parliament uh, in support of moving forward with own resources. Now, during the last Council, the heads of state and government did make progress on this matter in the, the conclusion stated the 21st of July, but there are several points worth flagging up here. Firstly, the principle of reimbursement and with own resources, that has been established, and work... Um, on this is reaching its conclusion. However, there is a weakness here. It seems in leading to, reading between the lines of conclusion, some member states believe that the measures are not binding enough. The Commission wants to make proposals in 2021 for the GAFA tax and the, uh, uh, with an eye on introducing these in 2023. The EU has called for the introduction of own resources, and this should be done uh, on the, in order to move forward. Now, but it's not entirely clear. Now, in other um, councils, the conclusions have not been particularly clear. They have not been binding, and this means, as uh, Jose Manuel says, Jose Fernandez has said, this just leads to 32 years of uh, dragging our feet. So our concern is that we won't have own resources, and our objective here today is uh, clear. We want to reconcile. Uh, the spirit with the letter, as uh, uh, José Manuel Fernández said, we have a clear timetable. We hope that both sides will be able to uh, reach an agreement. We're looking at uh, um, an accelerated process. We'll be voting on the, the timetable this afternoon as well, and it should be based on an inter-institutional uh, agreement, so it should be able, which should mean we'll avoid any backpedaling in the future. We believe this particular battle plan is absolutely key to our success. As José Manuel has said, we need two things here. We need own resources. Um, if we don't have them, we'll have uh, uh, a smaller global envelope for the MFF, or Member states will have to make contributions, and when we say member states, we mean citizens are making contributions. And uh, as José Manuel says, uh, it shouldn't be the citizens who, who pay. We're talking about Chinese businesses who are producing pollution, uh, large multinationals. They're the ones who should be uh, paying. Do I have a little bit more time? Thank you, Chair. Another key point for the Parliament... When we talk about uh, the budget, we tend just to think about the figures, but actually it all boils down to our values and principles. Uh, now, as we said last week, uh, Renew, the Greens, s and PP, we have called for support for the, e for the EU's values in terms of LGBTQ uh, rights, freedom of the press, 
uh, in some member states. And I think we need to take a close look at what's happening. Europe is not just a market. It is a community, a community of values. And these values have been uh, uh, supported and adopted by the member states themselves when they adopted and signed the treaties. And all we call for is a respect for these values and respect for the treaties. They're there for a reason. Uh, they're not just a, um, a words on a page. We believe we need a, a mechanism in order to ensure that these values are, are fully respected by all countries. At least from the negotiating team, uh, Rasmus Andresen uh, from the Greens. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to add three uh, points uh, to the remarks by the colleagues, which uh, I also support. And um, I think we are facing a very complicated situation right now where maybe some of the questions are more complicated than others. The rule of law obviously is uh, uh, quite complicated and um, as it seems now the question on the top ups of the programs will also be quite complicated and uh, there I think we really still need to send some strong messages on the flagship programs. We had a good, uh, uh, we have a good resolution with a clear mandate uh, for, for the programs like uh, uh, our colleague Ulbricht already mentioned and uh, I really think we also need to communicate today to the German minister later in the meeting that it's not acceptable uh, already now having diplomats quoting um, that uh, the parliament has to accept uh, no top ups they because there is no room for maneuver because we had a very long there had been a very long a meeting of the council and this is what we are ending up with and the parliament has to accept the results of the council i think we should be very clear here and communicate that this won't be acceptable for the european parliament and that we will um, yeah end up uh, and uh, we will be ready for having a tough uh, fight on on the programs we think are important and then i think at least the German presidency needs to explain to us now why they are actually not going for uh, uh, an increase in the health program, for example, or in many other programs the colleagues already mentioned. So um, this is on, on what I see on where we are related to the programs now, but I also think we need to talk uh, uh, and have uh, 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 negotiations, hard negotiations on the horizontal questions like the midterm review, but also on questions like climate, biodiversity, but also gender, where we could hear yesterday in the debate about the climate study that we have a lot of problems there related to the mechanisms we are uh, having related to the European budget and that there is a uh, that there are a lot of problems related to the way we are counting, for example, climate uh, 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 tr uh, tracking of biodiversity. And uh, there we really need to ensure that we will end up with strong mechanisms so that the Commission is changing how they are counting uh, yeah, the climate question, for example, or, uh, or the biodiversity uh, question. And it's the same on gender, where... My colleague Margarita Marquez told me that she was part of uh, implementing that back in the 90s, that she worked in the Commission at that time. But uh, still there we know that it's not effective what we are doing and we need really to, to work on that uh, together with the, with the Presidency um, and uh, the European Commission. And the last thing I would like to say is that I think we, the most important point is that we in the Parliament are sticking together and that we are continuing in a way a broad majority had shown in the last months. Because um, if we're not doing that, then we will be weakened. And then nobody of us will get some of the priorities maybe each political group has to the process. And uh, uh, this is why I think this will be quite quite important not to become nervous, but uh, to really show uh, responsibility to fight and negotiate hard with the willingness of making an agreement at the end. We don't want to block uh, uh, the, the agreement, but we need to ensure that uh, yeah, we will get some strong results and uh, we will live up to the mandate we've got from our colleagues uh, in the last uh, plenary session. And then I'm quite optimistic that we will be uh, successful with that. Um, and the time argument uh, some already are using in the public against the European Parliament 
I, I think we should be very clear there that this is a bad argument because uh, it was the council which killed the bridge solution where we were ready in deciding today or to, uh, tomorrow in this, uh, in this meeting basically already and the council decided not to have a bridge for this year. This is one of the reasons why I think that the, that the member states shouldn't use this argument uh, on timing and the other argument is of course that we have been waiting for two years on an agreement uh, and, and we have been ready for a long time and if there are delays to some of the programs then it's not the uh, not because of the Parliament, it's because of the delays in the Council, and I think we should be very clear on that. Thank you, uh, Rasmus. Ooh, I now switch to the shadow rapporteurs for uh, two minutes each. First of all, uh, Mr. Corner, uh, renew. Vielen Dank, Herr Präsident, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Wir haben diese Fragen ja jetzt viel diskutiert und immer, wenn unser Verhalten Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Thank you for giving me the floor. We've identified our priorities very intensively over the last few uh, months, and now we really have to get down to work very seriously. And if we look under the German presidency's priorities, it's clear we're on the same page. Now, I don't want to say much about the priorities themselves at this moment because I think we have discussed these in different um, resolutions uh, over the last few months, but uh, I'd rather like to discuss our strategies. Now, when we discuss these with uh, journalists, for example, or others outside of the, the European Parliament, I get the impression that the people are on our side. The flagship programs that we've discussed here before uh, do have our support. We want to strengthen them because we're talking about uh, um, people who need to be uh, protected, our citizens who need to be protected, upholding the values of the EU. Now, but if we talk on uh, in more depth with the journalists, that they um, question where we stand. And I always say, well, look, uh, this European Parliament uh, is not the same European Parliament as in the last few years. We, we have a lot more independent uh, MEPs, and uh, it's a very different beast. Perhaps some issues which are very important to uh, some citizens or MEPs are, uh, mean nothing to others. So I think we have to be very clear. We have to be very clear about where we stand, what our position is as a European Parliament is at each stage of negotiations. We have to work on our communication. I believe the rule of law is absolutely central to our discussions because if on our discussions on the budget we don't include uh, a mechanism on the rule of law, then I have serious concerns that we will need further negotiations in the future because it, the, the budget really does provide the foundations for the support of the principles and the values of the EU. And I think the negotiating team has been doing an excellent job. I would like to thank them. And I think today, this, af this afternoon, we'll be sending out a clear message to the German presidency saying you can't just uh, sweep us aside. We are here and we are strong as a European Parliament. Mr. Zani, uh, ID. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies for the delay. I didn't hear the first part of the discussion, but as you know, it's not that easy to get to Brussels these days by plane. I did follow the discussions and I followed the work of the negotiating team and I looked at the work done by the contact group with the uh, President Sassoli's group. So we know all about all of the main issues that we're facing. Our colleagues recall these before me. I want to focus on two points. It was mentioned that the majority of this parliament have two main issues for an agreement. First of all, the rule of law and own resources. But it's clear that we must be reasonable we know that in Council, as regards the rule of law, two states are firmly against this, and have, uh, m this has meant that the whole agreement reached on the recovery fund was kind of uh, thrown away. And then when it comes to own resources, two, 
a binding commitment is important, but we also need to consider the fact that if member states were willing to have a broader plan, then we would have reached an agreement and we would have had certainty in previous meetings and in the Council meeting at the end of July. So perhaps focusing on these two priorities is not the best strategy. I think rather that it would be a lot more useful. And on this specific topic, I didn't hear a lot spoken about in Parliament. I think we should be focusing on some budget items in particular and uh, bringing them back if they were cut. For instance, the Common Agricultural Policy. Certainly, there's an agreement that this was one of the main policies of the European Union for many years. Now there are new priorities, but it's still an important sector. It's an important productive sector for Europe, particularly at a difficult point in time. It must be supported in light of international tensions and we might see a change in value chains as regards supply of food too. So I think that an approach of this type might be useful in reaching an agreement. An ambitious one, but not a utopian one. We know that these two red lines, rule of law and own resources, must be kept in mind. There is a risk that we might move towards a more utopian idea and focus just on resources for some uh, items that have been cut significantly in the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Zile from ECR. Um, ECR. Hello, Chairman and uh, hello, colleagues. I hope you hear me. Uh, well, first of all, I think it was already rightly said that uh, mixing a new recovery instrument together with a classical MFF, where we have a clear rights for consent in a one package, creates these problems. And I agree with Jan Orbeck what he said, that in that case, in, during negotiations, we have to ask also revision in, in, a, in a policies, measures where definitely in a seven years uh, measures that are a re reduction of money. Uh, on time argument, which has been said here, I think this is not playing in our hands, whatever we will say, why it's delays for, uh, for uh, uh, all this package. Uh, Council will not split this package definitely, and also we will have a political pressure from countries which are looking very much on the resilience and recovery facility, uh, where the delays of this money coming to reality, it created disparities between member states because, as we know, recovery instrument in some member states is uh, not even start, but the recovery in the economy started better, or like in Germany and in some uh, eastern, uh, sorry, mainly southern countries, it's still uh, pretty deep, and this can create uh, additional uh, political tensions and pressure on the parliament with the time argument will be significant. On flagship programs versus uh, resilience and, and, and uh, recovery facility, I think we have to take into account that, uh, of course, uh, RFF is mainly national envelopes, and uh, uh, flagship programs, uh, we can say that there are more you will value added, but at the same time uh, it's not enough financed in some uh, fields like uh, even geopolitical goals, like connecting Euro facility, uh, European Defence Fund, or mobility, uh, military mobility, uh, and the only uh, well possibility could be to get uh, some additional resources in Horizon uh, programs or health. On all resources, just a few words. ECR in general is uh, can leave also with a council conclusion on this field, but of course we are not against if council would be pressed to create a new, more precise roadmap in a, uh, for uh, for own resources to repay back uh, money from own resources, not with a reduction on the future MFFs. At the same time, um, uh, we have to be sure that we can, cannot say that somebody said countries and said country citizens will pay instead of Europeans for uh, own resources. In economy theory, it works differently. If you create uh, some border objectives or uh, borders uh, or, or obstacles on something, at the end it's paid by consumers or by some other stakeholders in economy. That's why I think we are playing a bit too much with this uh, political arguments that uh, for our debt for uh, recovery instrument, somebody pay uh, instead of Europeans. It doesn't work like that in economy in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, let me uh, 
interrupt here and say I see some agitated, uh, slightly agitated body language in the room. Uh, we first do the shadows of the MFF, which means Mr. Corner, Mr. Zani, Mr. Zile, and now Mr. Papadimoulis, and then afterwards we'll have the three shadows on their own resources. That's the way we uh, put up the, the meeting. So next is Mr. Papadimoulis, but he could not be present. So Mr. Uh, Kokalis will read the message Mr. Papadimoulis, Mr. Papadimoulis wants, wants to, to, bring to us. Bring to us. Please. Please. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask for the excuse of Mr. Papadimoulis. Uh, there is no more time to waste in this negotiation. Uh, I would like to congratulate the negotiating team. Uh, the virus is coming back, it's continuing to strike, and at the same time, it's continuing to weaken uh, our economies. This is the time where we face uh, the worst crisis of our generation and we determine the future of uh, the next generation. The European Parliament, as the budgetary authority, should ensure that recovery starts as soon as possible and that we build back in a resilient manner. The current union budget is vital for responding to the challenges faced by citizens and reflects the needs for effective and efficient spending on sustainable development, not only from an economic, or an, but also from a social and environmental point of view. However, the money that is currently allocated to the MFF is less than what we, we need to uh, deliver our policies. While we welcome the decision to allocate 30% of the MFF to expenses related to the Green Deal, would like to see them better accounted for, and there are many more aspects still in the proposals that remain heavily underfunded. This is not enough to uh, achieve the Paris Agreement goals, the Paris Climate Agreement. We need more investment in climate protection and biodiversity, and we must ensure that there is not a single EU project in the budget that is not compatible with the Paris Agreement and science-based. Finally, an MFF below the Commission proposal is neither viable nor acceptable by the Parliament. It is also necessary to have a mid-term review so that the effects can be redefined and re-evaluated. The last reform of the own resources system took place 32 years ago. So we fully agree with the position that the Parliament must not approve the MFF without agreement on the reform of the own resources system. Let the, let the Council finally get the message more clearly than it has. We need an immediate binding agreement and timetable, including the introduction of a set of new own resources that can cover the cost of the next generation EU program, the capital and the interest, in order at the same time to ensure the reliability and sustainability of the repayment plan and not burden uh, future generations with uh, undue climate conditions. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kokalis, speaking for Mr. Papadimoulis. Uh, we now switch to the uh, uh, own resources shadows. First of all, uh, Madame Gualmini, SND. Yes, I don't know if you can uh, see me, but I hope that you can hear me because I have some problems with the camera. So, Madame Gualmini. <laughs> If we don't see you, uh, you are not translated. So please push the bottom of your camera. I'm sorry, my camera does not work. So I can speak in English if it is not a problem. Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. I apologize. Uh, actually, I really would like to underline the importance of the opinion uh, on the own resources that we are voting today. Uh, it is an important step forward, uh, both politically and strategically, for uh, the European Union, because it is really an, an original, innovative, and effective trial to expand the role of the own resources, not only to find Finance the next generation EU, which is of course our utmost priority, but also 
to rebalance you know the weight of the national contributions within the european budget and together with the weight of own resources we do believe as the treaty asks us that we need brand new own resources in order to finance the policies of the european union and we believe also that the huge crisis that we are facing cannot be paid by citizens cannot be paid by families, but by those who haven't contributed enough up to now. There are some very important points in the opinion. The first one is the legally binding calendar that we propose in order to introduce step-by-step -step different and specific own resources. Just to make some example, we speak about uh, uh, you know the, the plastic tax uh, by uh, 2021 together with the, the ETS uh, and then the carbon adjustment mechanism and the digital service uh, by 2023 the financial transaction tax by 2024 and then the CCCTB by 2026 so just to say and to point out that our commitment is real and is effective. Then there is also a reference in the opinion, which is very important for us, I believe, to the role of Parliament in the co-decision making concerning own resources. We believe that within the Conference on the Future of Europe, we have to discuss again the competencies and the role of the Parliament as for own resources. And finally, there is also a reference which we believe is important to the single market levy that is to a sort of a new revenue connected to a fairer uh, uh, social and economic market. So I really hope that uh, the vote will be absolutely positive and I hope that uh, uh, this uh, innovative change will open a new path for the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Gualmini. Uh, next is Madame Laporte, ID. Oui, pardon. Merci, Monsieur. Yes, thank you, Chairman. As regards own resources, we're talking about the amount given by the Commission, which then became 350 billion loans and 390 billion grants, and we add that to the MFF. So we have the total of that amount. Now, the 390 billion by 20 to 21 to 2027 will be given to states most hit by the crisis. In contrary to the 360 loans, uh, these will be paid back by member states in the Union. So we see a transfer of money. But the question is raised as to how the Commission is going to pay back all of these loans. We are explained that businesses uh, from China and the US will not have uh, loans involved in the recovery plan. So we should be thinking about that. Manuel Macron... Our president has stated that the French and the Europeans will not be paying for these uh, grants. Rather, it will be all on um, large businesses using various taxes. So what's going to happen at the end of the day? Money will enter the EU coffers, but there will be taxes, and that will uh, be impacting um, Europe. We might see inflation too because businesses will have to uh, change costs. So we will be paying out at the end of the day. The Council has set out a time frame so that the Commission can work to, by 2023, have new own resources. But there's no guarantee that these new own resources, aside from the plastic tax next year, will be operational in 2027 or will ever see the day. As regards taxation, unanimity of all member states is required. As regards the GAFA tax, for instance, I objectively think uh, Ireland is not going to give its uh, positive opinion on this. These new own resources might not be created, and the consequence is simple. Every country will have to pay to the EU every year. 
Uh, this is all part of the European Union programs for the budget to come afterwards. Could you tell me, please, if you are going to modify the rule of unanimity as regards taxation so that we can have a qualified majority? And can you also indicate your intentions if new own resources are not available by 2023? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Laporte. Mr. Corman for the Greens, please. Merci, Monsieur le... Thank you, Chairman. Colleagues, this is a key moment of time for the debate, but it's also a key moment in time for the future of Europe and the European Union to see what we are going to do. There are two topics among all those raised. Sovereignty of the European Parliament to ensure that we remain democratically the masters of the ex expenses that we want to manage. And another issue is own resources. To be frank, I hesitate to use the term, but we see a kind of blackmail operated by Council against us, stating, you must cede on the MFF own resources and your democratic sovereignty for expenses because there is a health emergency and you must at all costs cede in order to help countries in difficulty. So we're in a key moment in time. Either we accept to interiorise this kind of blackmail or we consider, and I think we should do this, that this momentum is going to be decisive for reconquering democratic sovereignty. And this will be a means of having solidarity. And this way we can help various countries to benefit from European solidarity with the recovery plan own resources that we have today will condition the solidarity of tomorrow. If today we give up on these new resources, these are tax resources with our just taxation. We're not talking about uh, any kind of taxation. We're talking about people who are uh, not paying taxes. And the European Union, we have a critical mass to do this. We can recover this money to have real solidarity. So I would call on you to be determined, to be calm. We must be uh, calm. We must have a strong, calm team behind us. The European Parliament has done its job and we have made a proposal which was uh, voted on in the month of July. Now it's up to the Council to do its job and the only power that we have is to show that we are capable and we don't want to do it but we could block this so that we can strengthen democracy, uh, ensure just taxation and ensure solidarity which the union needs. Merci uh, monsieur Corman. I have uh, three requests uh, for uh, from other members. First of all uh, monsieur La Routourou, une minute. Merci monsieur le président. Thank you chair. Uh, if I may I'd like to say that we can uh, say that I absolutely agree with the first five uh, speakers and what David just said we see that the parliament is united in wanting to make things move forward. We have three problems now. The ratification by 27 member states of the emergency plan. The second problem is avoiding a recession when three years later we return to the normal budget. And the third issue is financing the Green Deal. The situation has been catastrophic in terms of climate. We must not forget about climate issues. When it comes to ratification in all of our countries, we're starting to have people who are saying, watch out, Belgium will lose 12 billion. Watch out, France is going to lose 27 billion. So we can say quickly that there will be own resources and Belgium will only gain five billion and will have nothing to pay back. Or if we can say in France, we can, we can tell Madame Laporte and others that France will gain uh, 40, billion, 40 billion and will have to reimburse it. I think that that ratification will be much easier. The second point, avoiding falling back into a, into a recession. I am an economist. I've been watching Japan for 30 years and every time that the recovery plan stops, Japan returns to a recession. So we may have a three-year recovery plan, but in three years, if we have a smaller European budget and, all, and in all member states, there need to be classic policies, we can be almost certain that we will return to a serious recession. So serious own resources need to be available in the coming years, and in particular in 2024, we need to have a real European budget fed into by your, uh, 
own resources. Now, when it comes to the Green Deal, we know that a real Green Deal can create 5 million jobs across the EU and villages and big cities big cities in agriculture and energy and construction. If we don't have your massive, sustainable European financing, we won't have the necessary dynamic in energy or in transportation in three years when the budget uh, changes. So we need to have own resources. There. So the three problems, have they have one solution, own resources, and we need to decide now, not uh, once every seven years during the negotiations. We thought that the report was very nice, but it doesn't change the reality. As David said, keep calm and negotiate. We need to Show the negotiators that we are with them, with the NGOs, with the unions, and that we won't uh, we won't budge. Now, when it comes to the calendars, uh, the calendar proposed is excellent. We need to have an agreement on the entire calendar and all the own resources. That's very important. But I think there's one point which will really make the dossier move, and that's the tax on financial uh, financial transactions which was proposed in 2011, we redid the calculations, and despite Brexit and despite the economic crisis, every year it could bring in 500 billion euros, and that is doable within two years. It's if we have that money coming in every year, we can have $15 billion to reimburse the uh, emergency plan, $15 million to pay back the shared debt. We have millions for Erasmus, Horizon, the Green Deal. So that alone could help us move forward. And it's the only own resource that Ms. Laporte has not criticized because we see that Plastic tax can fall on the citizens, same with the carbon tax, but the tax on the financial markets, uh, I think we can agree that you won't won't criticize that. Uh, This was a tweet uh, last week about uh, taxes on financial markets, even a small one, could even have a great impact. Ms. Merkel said that it was a very important move. She mentioned it this year, and I think the Parliament is very legitimate to ask for the entire calendar and put serious uh, pressure in this regard. Thank you. Next is Monsieur Kuz- Mr. Kuzmiuk, ECR. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'd like to draw your attention to two issues. We are clearly dealing with a tactic of delays uh, on the MMF and on the recovery plan. Um, The uh, European institutions uh, uh, dock uh, their responsibility, and I think uh, the main uh, problem will be uh, reality. We have uh, data on the second quarter, and in some countries, uh, GDP fell by 20 percent. By the end of the year, the average uh, drop of GDP will be at the level of 10 percent. This means serious economic and social problems in the member states. Those drops are being observed despite of the fact that the member states have spent some two uh, trillion uh, euros to um, improve the situation. So uh, reality um, will wake us up. So uh, what's happening right now doesn't make sense. The second issue is um, transfers... uh, within the recovery plan. And there were supposed to be uh, funds for the cohesion policy and the agricultural policy, and uh, there are cuts in these two uh, policies. So I support the, po- the Italian colleague who wants additional uh, funds for these two policies. If uh, agriculture was so crucial in the uh, period of uh, the pandemic, why are we cutting? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kokalis, GUI, this time in his own name. Please, Mr. Kokali, can, you can uh, press your speak button.
We go to the next speaker. We see whether we can get a hold of Mr. Kokalis. Mr. Kirtsos, EPP. We cannot hear you, Mr. Kirtsos. You have to push the speak button. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a large majority of MEPs uh, strive for a more ambitious MFF. I think we should continue our efforts because I believe that the recovery fund is not sufficient to fund the recovery of the European economy. Uh, first, things are going um, worse than we anticipated. The continuation of the pandemic does not allow us to organize the, economy, the recovery of the European economy, especially in countries like Greece, uh, in where, where the tourist sector and the services sector is dominant in the economy. Second, we are faced with the second wave of COVID-19. Uh, it's obvious that the pandemic will last longer, so we have to get prepared for this uh, uh, for this uh, situation. And third, we keep falling behind our competitors, uh, China and the United States of America. China is much more efficient in combating COVID-19, and uh, the recovery of the Chinese economy has already started. And the USA has a lot of problems, but still it's more dynamic in its economic policy as far as COVID-19 is concerned. So uh, I think we should keep trying uh, according to the wishes of the majority of MEPs. Thank you. Thank you. This exhausts my list of uh, speakers. Um, I think it's an understatement to say that uh, this team will come back uh, to us, at least to the negotiating team, but certainly also to the committee in uh, uh, as it uh, stands today. So um, we will be back on these issues in the coming weeks with beyond any doubt. And of course, I remind you at this point in time of the exchange of view that we have with the German Minister of uh, European Affairs, Mr. Roth, Mr. Michael Roth. We go to the next point on our agenda, point 12, with respect to building policy. Every year, the institutions uh, must submit a report on their building policy to the attention of the budgetary authority. We already had in this com committee an exchange of view with two, the two vice presidents, Mr. Wieland and Mr. Silva Pereira, and with the Secretary General, Mr. Welle, on the Parliament's building policies. Today we have the honour of having the people of the European Commission here, uh, in, uh, and of course this will uh, help us to better understand the approach on buildings and the main projects ahead. So I give the floor now to Mr. Marc Bequet, uh, head of the Commission's Brussels Infrastructure Office, and Mr. Uh, Thomas Kirchner, head of the L Commission's Luxembourg Infrastructure Office, uh, both for uh, five minutes. Please, uh, Mr. Becquet, the floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. A bit of context, perhaps. The uh, Commission has a portfolio of roughly uh, 100,000 square meters in Brussels, 907,000 are buildings roughly, 60% are owned, 40% are rented. The total uh, um, not all of them are currently used by the Commission, the others are shared with the various agencies and the anti-fraud office as well. The context regarding real estate policy leads us to examine prolongations and renegotiations of leases. We also have a program for renovation and development, and we're currently searching for new services and greener, more energy efficient buildings. And finally, we are focusing on optimizing the use of these services. The last presentation 
which was made to the Parliament on this topic, was the 24th of September of last year, and since then the context has naturally changed considerably. We are in a post-pandemic, or almost post-pandemic, context. We have learned a number of lessons. We also have the ambitions of the Green Deal, which aim for the Commission being carbon neutral by 2030, and we also want to optimize the new resources in the new MFF. So our areas for action are focused on two main areas. Make each square meter greener and have a smarter use of each square meter. We have carried out a quick analysis of the strengths, threats, weaknesses, and opportunities, which are summarized here on the slide that you can see. I won't go into them in detail in order to save time. What are the upcoming projects which will be presented in the future? There's the renewal of the Albert Borchette Conference Center, which is upcoming, the extension, uh, rather, uh, projects for Loi 51, also for the Beaulieu 1, 5, and 9 buildings, which are currently in a transition phase, and also an extension to the Montoyer 34 building, which is a building that we will prepare for new developments. Some reflections are underway, including regarding the uh, Homerston uh, Child Care Center, also redevelopment for Bredell and Bredell 2 buildings, and redevelopment for three buildings in the Beaulieu neighborhood, Beaulieu 23, 31, and 33. We also have, uh, we're also considering the project for Loire 130, but that will be further in the future. And we will need to have learned the lessons of this new normality, which we're facing now because of the COVID crisis. The projects to present, I already uh, described them. The projects where reflection is underway as well. I went over that just now. Now about making the square meters greener and smarter. It's clear that every square meter in a high-performance building, having an optimized uh, use of square meters in high-performance buildings will allow us to reduce our CO2 emissions, but we will also reduce the total amount of uh, square meters going down to 743,000 as a target in the coming years. We also will take into account behavioral changes, which also are the result of this new changing reality. We are also going to accelerate the implementation of new ways of working, because we all know that distance working or working from home is going to have a more important role now than before. And that also has an impact on the use of square meters. I'd also like to share two elements which are related to regulations in Brussels region. First, the Plage regulation related to reducing emissions from primary consumption in buildings, namely a 10% reduction for 2025, so that has an immediate impact on uh, buildings, some of them which are too old. Uh, uh, we will need to find alternatives with more high-performance buildings. And then the Cobras regulation, which sets out the number of parking spaces that need to be available. That will also have an impact on our buildings. We will need to reduce or convert certain parking spaces. And we have a particularly ambitious plan, a project to create bicycle hubs with all the necessary facilities. So in the interest of time, Mr. Chair, I will stop here. I'm at your, avail uh, I'm at your disposal to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Becquet. Uh, good afternoon. I will present you the, the situation for, for Luxembourg. And uh, uh, as it was already presented uh, for, for Brussels, 
uh, much has happened since the last uh, presentation in, uh, in September last year, which will also, of course, have an impact on the, the situation and what will happen in the future for Luxembourg. This is, will be less the case for, for the buildings as such. It will more have an impact on the, on the way how we use and how we will optimize the, the use of the, of the office space. So uh, I will briefly recall the, the situation for, for Luxembourg, um, where we have to, uh, to cover office space for roughly 4,700 staff members in 17 buildings, out of which 19, uh, nine are office buildings on, uh, on the three sites, on the, the Kirchberg site, on the north, in the center, and in the, the Gasberich. Now, because we will move um, in the midterm future to a new building, to the Jean Monnet II, uh, most of or all of our buildings, they are, um, they are leased except the, the Euroforum, uh, which is subject for a long-term uh, lease until 2034. So, as you know, the Jean Monnet is uh, for Luxembourg the big uh, flagship project, and those are the main parameters, I think, uh, with, with which you are certainly familiar. So it's on the Kirchberg side. The total agreed budget is uh, 442.8 million, and uh, for a capacity of 3,700 uh, persons. Um, very important in the context of the, of the Green Deal is, uh, of course, the, the energy performance and the sustainability of the, um, the building as such, which will be uh, certified at the level of excellent um, under, um, under the BREEAM certification. Now, the um, state of play, the excavation works uh, have been completed in July. You will see on the next two slides some, some photos. Uh, phase one and two structural works uh, are in progress. Now, uh, regarding the schedule, what um, is the current schedule for phase one, which is the, the main building, you see on the left side the, the flatter building. Uh, the li delivery initially is foreseen for, for February 23 and the phase two one year later in 2024. Now, um, COVID-19 uh, has passed by this and uh, also some, some other issues. Um, there was a complete um, shutdown of the, the construction site. And um, as of today, since the, the shutdown, the productivity on the site is reduced because they had to put in place a new work organization and also um, uh, new protective measures. And this will, of course, have an impact on the schedule uh, which, uh, and the budget which needs to be assessed. Now, for the time being, or as of today, I'm not in a position to give you any details on this because it's too early, because uh, the, the, the situation is not yet over, and we do not have yet all the full information. Uh, we will have a steering committee um, which will take place uh, next week. So the GMO steering committee, uh, where the commission meets together with the, the project manager, so the Luxembourg authorities, and there we will uh, um, we will discuss the um, the issue on uh, the impact from the from the COVID-19, and maybe also other technical uh, problems issues that were raised by the by the architect. So uh, then, once we have a clearer situation of this, then of course we will uh, keep you informed in. Uh, in due time. Uh, as promised here, this was the construction site in July, uh, one year ago. So you see the excavation works ongoing, with even on the, on the bottom of the page uh, still uh, a relicate of the, of the old Germany One building. And here you see the, um, the works, the situation as it was just before the summer break in, in July. Uh, in the middle bottom uh, is the, the footprint for the, for the phase two. So you see uh, phase one, the rest, and phase two, they are progressing uh, um, in, on the level of the con construction works. Last point I want to make is uh, uh, we, have, um, to adapt our, we have to adapt our, uh, several of our lease agreements to the, to the schedule of the, of the Jean Monnet. So some of them were already passed uh, uh, by the budgetary authority for approval. We have two more, the Besch and, and the Ariane building. Um, to, uh, to adapt the, the, the end date when we want to move out of the building, but also to introduce some flexibility that allows us to uh, adjust to the, the schedule of the end of the Jean Monnet. Um, we still um, fine-tune the inter institutional child care, child care center that will replace uh, some existing very old buildings. 
and there we foresee the, um, the communication, uh, a pre-information to the budget authority by end of, of this year. And last not least, uh, um, just to highlight, because again, important for the, for the Green Deal, you know about the Mercier Post Building, uh, that's the new building where the publication office will move in. Um, this is also, it's not the BREAM certification, it's a German certification, the DGNB, uh, where it also will have a very high energy efficiency rating. So I will stop here also, and uh, I'm happy to take some questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kishner. Madam Keller, the Standing Rapporteur for Buildings Policy, please. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair. Thank you very much indeed uh, to the Luxembourg and Brussels offices. Uh, they've been following the issues on, on related to the European Commission's buildings and the policies. Uh, now, a few questions in line with what um, you presented to us, but I would like some clarifications. You talked about the Green Deal goals, environmental objectives. Perhaps you could tell us more about the works envisaged in order to reach these objectives. I'm thinking about the uh, objectives, uh, political objectives set by uh, our institutions or those set by Brussels and Luxembourg authorities. Now, in Brussels, I've noted, and as have many other colleagues, that very often the building method tends to be well, you tend to favour demolishing the building, um, even if the buildings are only 30 odd years old, completely demolished, then rebuilt. If you look at 130 Rue de la Loire, uh, the Commission's uh, flagship project here in uh, Brussels, have you defined a new method to ensure that? Uh, we no longer have these disposable buildings because they really that that approach really doesn't conform with the principles of sustainability which we wish to promote. Secondly, this is something you did mention, but perhaps you could uh, clarify a couple of points. Covid has resulted in a different way of working. A large number of staff members are working from home. There's been new ways of organizing work and questions asked about uh, open space, um, organizing a workforce, and what concrete impact could this have on projects uh, above and beyond the 5% uh, reduction in surface area in Brussels? Are you considering more structural changes? Is this something you're working on? Perhaps uh, you could tell us a little about about the approach taken, the methods used, uh, and what impact uh, the COVID crisis might have on your organisation of the workforce and uh, what impact this might have on building policy. Then a couple of more operational projects. Uh, 130 Rue de la Loire, it's an enormous project. Uh, yes, it will um, be launched in 2025, but the uh, Concours of um, Architects projects were launched last year. When do you envisage uh, publishing the early warning for this to the committee so we can examine the project and uh, assess uh, what uh, the related costs might be? Secondly, Luxembourg and the last project you mentioned, Jean Monnet. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about this and tell us about uh, what the financial costs of the delays in this project might be because, um, once again, we're looking at 440 million euros. I mean, it's a, it's a very large project indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Keller. Reporters, um, for maximum two minutes each, um, Madam Holmeyer is not there. Then we immediately go to Mr. Uzakov's uh, SND. Thank you, Mr. President. When we talk about the building policy and all the projects we have seen, obviously we do understand that none of us, since we're in budget committee, has an opportunity to use a crystal ball. But can we just agree on the future that any time we will there is a change in any project that can be either delayed or cancelled that we are really in before or informed so we can take all the uh, decisions and information that would be extremely useful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uzakov. Mr. Kuz, ID. Thank 
Just wait a moment. Vielen Dank, Herr Vor Thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of questions myself. We heard that the surface area will drop by 5%. My question is, when is that planned? When do you want to reach that goal? Will it just uh, be a result of the new teleworking opportunities, or is this going to be done uh, in another way? Then you said 10%. We want to reduce uh, um, some of the usage by 10% over the next few years. Um, shouldn't this fall by a lot more? Uh, if we're looking at buildings such as Jean Monnet, which will be um, more completely carbon neutral, I think that if we're looking at carbon neutral buildings in the future, this 10% figure is far too low. Then something which surprised me, there were a number of buildings used for the Joint Research Centre. It says here the Joint Research Centre is a commissioned science and knowledge service. So the JRC should contribute to the overall objectives of Horizon 2020. But Horizon 2020 – well, that's not something up for discussion anymore in this uh, uh, committee. Uh, we had over 10 billion euros for the member states uh, for research and development uh, in order to achieve uh, goals of um, the member states. But if it's up to member states to, care, to implement these projects, then – why does the Commission have uh, so many buildings here in the Commission? I mean, I'm not entirely clear. There's, is there not a conflict of interests here? Are the resources uh, uh, available under Horizon 2020 actually being used for funding the Commission's buildings? Uh, I mean, I do have some questions about the, the lack of transparency here. Greens. Yes, thank you. Um, I have some few questions related to uh, to the uh, strategy of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. But first of all, I would like to to stress and to support one of the points uh, one of the colleagues made earlier on the information. I I guess it's really important that we always get the information about the process in the projects or about new projects in the right time. Because in my first year here in Parliament, we had many times the situation that there wasn't really time to discuss some of the elements because we always had to decide earlier, uh, urgently about some of the pro uh, uh, projects. And uh, this is really uh, not good because then it's not so easy for us to understand some of the decisions we have to take on the building policy. But any uh, way I would like to ask on uh, about the carbon neutrality strategy and on some elements there. So um, you were mentioning some behavioral changes you uh, uh, would like to see or you uh, you will work on my question is what is part of this um, except from the bicycle hype you were talking about is for example waste reduction also uh, included in this strategy and what are you doing there because I think in the institutions we have a problem related to um, to uh, the waste uh, situation and then on the energy consumption I would like to hear what kind of energy will be uh, 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 part of, of uh, uh, the usage in the future um, when you are having the goal of becoming carbon uh, neutral by 2030 because there are a lot of different uh, elements in it and I would like to hear a little bit more details um, yeah, about the plans you have there. Thank you. Mr. Juncha for ECR. Could you very briefly, thanks to the rapporteur, we were able to um, see what our 
uh, real estate assets are. So what are the plans to uh, um, remove the yellow pipes, uh, gas pipes, if, if you have such plans? How much will it cost? And we are also witnessing uh, the practice of teleworking uh, right now, and we have different experiences on teleworking. So maybe we should have a plan. Instead of investing in office buildings, uh, which are empty right now, maybe we could transfer these funds uh, to uh, teleworking. Thank you, Mr. Joncha. Uh, I didn't get any other requests from other members to speak on this issue, so I guess we can go back to, Mr. to Monsieur Bequet for the, uh, an answer to the several questions that have been raised. Monsieur Bequet. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll try and group some of those questions in order to save time. On the Green Deal, as I said, we're going to make considerable effort to reduce emissions, so we'll be working on uh, reducing our energy consumption. Um, the energy we do consume, we want to ensure it's as uh, least polluting possible. Then mobility. We want to um, change the form of mobility used by colleagues. Then on waste disposal, we want to uh, restrict the amount of waste we produce and ensure that uh, um, as much as possible can be recycled. Now, we all managed to switch to a paperless uh, way of working uh, with very little notice when we uh, went uh, uh, when we went, uh, when we went and moved into teleworking uh, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. So there's no reason to go back on that. Um, in terms of the cafeterias, the cafes, we want to ensure we're making the best possible use of the, any your resource, raw, raw, any raw materials that uh, uh, we are using. As for um, consulting the Parliament upstream, well, I've listed the dossiers that you will be dealing with, and they will uh, appear on your desk in the next few months, few months. So this means you shouldn't be taken by surprise. And this was a point which was raised by a couple of points, a couple of members of Parliament. Moving on, well, we're currently suffering the uh, consequences of the COVID uh, outbreak, um, both teleworking, using new uh, technologies to ensure that uh, we are as effective as possible when teleworking. How can we ensure that colleagues working from home have the necessary equipment and resources available so they can work in a, a, a safe and healthy manner? We want to m make better use of our buildings. And that will logically mean that we uh, have a smaller surface area, and some of these savings made here could be used to, to uh, fully equip those colleagues who are working from home uh, a considerable period of time. But in order not to uh, lose uh, the social um, ties, which are so important for our work, we want to um, make sure colleagues do remember, remain a member of their team, that they do have a space available for working from the office uh, on a regular basis. Building methods. Yes, indeed. We have uh, tended for some buildings... Uh, to uh, set the um, efficient lifespan as 30 years. And very often, developers tend to strip the building as much as possible. And that could be a good solution. That is keeping the structure, uh, the foundations, uh, um, and then it's uh, rebuilt, as it were, the structure is refitted so it's more energy efficient. That's one way of uh, working. And the other is completely demolishing a building and um, take uh, 
some examples. The tour, the one tower, which is uh, built on the site of an old hotel, the hotel could not be converted into an office building. There was a problem with the height of the ceilings. So there are certain cases where we simply can't uh, take the approach of refitting the uh, the structure of a building. And then uh, there, the city of Brussels decided that uh, they wanted to build a more flexible uh, building, a building that could at a later date be reconverted, and it wasn't just to used for offices or accommodation. It was the um, region of Brussels Capital which uh, decided on that approach. Now, Rue de la Loire, 130. Once we've concluded our considerations on a future uh, project here, we will be coming back to the Parliament and you will have the necessary uh, time to assess the project and um, what costs might be.